Welcome to the Business of Platforms, a video podcast series where Vivaldi will be chatting with the world's leading marketers, thinkers, and innovators about the evolution of business and the exciting ways in which platforms are helping companies and brands deliver greater value. So welcome, welcome, welcome uh, <laughs> to the Business of Platforms podcast. My name is Eric Joachim Stahler. Uh, I am here today with one of the most prolific writers, I should say. <laughs> he has published, according to uh, the sources, over 250 articles in the past two years. And on the top, he has written a book called Digital Darwinism. <laughs> this is Tom Goodwin. Welcome, Tom. It's very nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, I can say that Tom is the executive vice president of innovation at Zenith, a public pub, pub, publicity publicist company um, and that is an ROI agency. I think it's a media company. It is. It's a big media agency. Yeah. So Tom is one of these gentlemen I had. I try to get here on the seat and thank you so much for coming because Tom has this uncanny ability to capture important developments in business technology and marketing. You know, he's the kind of guy where you say like, I should have this written this. You know, <laughs> how, the, how did he do this? So for example, He's famous for having said this, Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. And Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. Thing, uh, real estate. Something interesting is happening, he says. Tom said this already in 2015. Um, so Tom, um, this is all what it's about. This is about platforms and, mm -hmm. and how companies translate from 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 uh, um, from uh, um, uh, from pipeline business to platform business. But let's first start with this amazing book, Digital <laughs> Darwinism. Um, you said in the beginning of the book that this was the most painful experience to ever write this book. <laughs> <laughs> why would you why would you want to have a painful experience to write a book? What motivated you? I guess I didn't really want to write a book. I think um, there are people on this planet that have a dream of writing a book um, and they romanticize the idea. Yeah. I didn't. Um, I'd written a lot of articles mm -hmm. and they'd always been published online. And what I loved about that was that you were able to learn from the conversations they started. So mm -hmm. the, the beautiful thing about the internet is people will tell you very quickly what they think about your work. Yeah. Um, well, that have, that's for you. You get 900 <laughs> likes on something. I get five. I might get 900 likes, but I also have 36 emails telling me I'm an idiot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and oddly, that's useful because it means you get to test theories. It mm -hmm. means that you don't um, become arrogant. And it means that you get to learn. And also, you, I mean, it sounds quite pretentious, but you get to start a conversation. So, yeah. you know, I think that a lot of what we talk about in marketing is a lot of nonsense. We talk about millennials, even though that's 2.5 billion people that were gathering together as one. So when you talk about that on the internet, it's great because a conversation starts. Yeah. Whereas books are quite frustrating because you put out all your thoughts, um, you know, you kind of bundle them together into this unit that gets printed and it can mm. never be changed. Uh, you have no idea mm. what people think about it. Um, so I didn't really want to write a book, but people persuaded me to write a book. Yeah. Um, and I had all these ideas and I kind of thought maybe there's a way to sort of craft them together into some sort of overriding mm. narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and then the book came together and yeah, it's, it's difficult and you're full of a lot of self-doubt yeah. and, and sort of vulnerability yeah. and not, not exactly imposter syndrome, but there's a sense where you think, you know, it, it, like, is this worth seven hours of someone's time? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, am I really right to challenge, you know, Harvard yeah. Business School professors on their thinking? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was, a, it was an amazing process to go through. It was somewhat yeah. cathartic. But you do it very successfully. So, so when, you say about, when you say Darwinism, digital yeah. Darwinism, what do you understand this to be? <laughs> and and um, I, I know this from college, from my, from my high school days. Yeah. And, and what do you understand this to be? And, and what sort of your, your, what is sort of like the three things that you would recommend? Yeah, I mean, I don't love the title, actually. Mm -hmm. The sort of title was given to me by the publishers and I didn't like it. And then they challenged me to come up with better ones and I couldn't. Mm -hmm. So like the, the spirit behind Darwinism is, is obviously the idea of the sort of survival of species and the degree to which things naturally will become extinct unless they evolve over time. 
Uh, so the sort of, the spirit of the book is rooted in the reality of a changing world yeah. and a world where the things that made you very successful in the past for many, many industries um, are either now not um, huge advantages or they're not advantages at all. Or in some cases, they're even disadvantages. Like if you're amazing at publishing a newspaper and you're great at... Um, you know, selling advertising, and you're mm -hmm. wonderful at negotiating on printing and mm -hmm. distributing physical newspapers. Like, to some extent, that's completely irrelevant to the yeah. skills you need in the, in the, in the sort of future. Um, so I was trying to sort of take a snapshot of this moment in time, mm -hmm. look at companies which are under, underestimating the existential risks that they have. Also look at companies that are not facing existential mm -hmm. risk. Like, if you're a, a sort of German brewer that's been run by a family since 1500, then, you know, drones. Called Bitburger. Yeah. The leading <laughs> German beer. Bitburger's a great beer. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure Bitburger did not wake up in the middle of the night thinking, what do drones mean for our business? Yes. You know, has blockchain going to screw us over? Because actually, they make great beer. Um, yeah. There are other good beer brands out there. Mm -hmm. um, but they make great beer and they'll be fine. Mm -hmm. um, but the book was really about looking at some of the dynamics that exist in the world. So ideas like platforms and mm -hmm. how owning things and having assets and having expertise in the mm -hmm. old paradigm is somewhat unhelpful. Mm -hmm. It's looking at things like the leapfrog effect where, yes. you know, we're both Europeans in America and we probably experience um, routinely, we experience much older technologies here. Yeah. You know, the planes that we fly on here are the oldest planes that ever fly on the banking system. Yeah. It's sort of built in the 1970s. Um, shopping malls feel very archaic. Yeah. You go to somewhere like China or India and you suddenly realize they've leapfrogged all of this stage yes. of development and they have the latest planes, the best banking, the best mobile phone networks and so on. Yeah. So that was another the idea of the leapfrog and then this idea of sort of disruption, yes. which is one of these horrible words that people use yes. all the time and just become meaningless. But I was looking at how is it that people like Tesla have mm -hmm. tripped up very successful large yes. auto companies? How has a company like Dyson uh, ruin business for people like Hoover, how has Facebook, you know, completely poked in the eye the New York Times yeah. and so on? No, but, you know, that's really tall order. I know Bitburger, this is a 600-year-old <laughs> beer. The basics of beer brewing hasn't changed. Yeah. They brew that beer in Bitburg, which is a very yeah. rural um, part of Germany and what's called in a, in a, in a, a mountainous area called, very beautiful landscapes, uh, called uh, Eiffel. And what I think is... is um, the thesis is that these companies are too slow given the changes that you see in the outside. Yeah. You know, Jack Welch once said, uh, if the rate of change in the inside is less than the rate, in the, in the, the rate of yeah. change in the outside, the end is near. Yeah, absolutely. In a way, so it's, you, it's, I mean, it, I, it's a little tall order to suggest <laughs> that when you're in the beer business in that location in the in Bitburg yeah. in the Eiffel in Germany, being the brewing where the brewing practices haven't really changed uh, in 500 or 700 yeah. years. This is a, a family business, yeah. and now you sort of your book suggests, you know, leap forward. Yeah. Uh, that's I mean that's almost like they, they perhaps this company needs to start start walking and maybe then yeah. jogging rather than leaping. Well, I was going to say, I, I, I would like to think what it's saying is that companies um, should be excited by new technology. Mm -hmm. They should be excited about the changes it mm -hmm. means for how people behave mm -hmm. and that they should have a very proactive and open-eyed yeah. um, sense of the world yeah. and they should not live in denial. And then they all have to choose their own paths. And it may be that Bitburger are very, very happy um, to manage the same market share mm -hmm. in a market that might not be changing mm -hmm. hugely in Germany. Mm -hmm. It is in other countries, but in, mm -hmm. in Germany, I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. And they might be happy to know that they could be doing stuff and make a conscious decision not to do that. Or they might want to make small changes to their business mm -hmm. and, and get some incremental sales from mm -hmm. a few things. Um, or they might want to reinvent themselves and you know turn into... Um, uh, entertainment platform for all we know. But I think the, the important thing for me about the book is that I would love people to be asking these questions and to, creating a, and to create a strategy. And I actually think that many companies are not doing this. I think, um, you know, the internet has radically changed our lives. Mm -hmm. Phones have only begun to change our life. And this is incredible technology that makes amazing things possible. And we can't just bury our head in the sand and sort of hope it goes away. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, the, so the lessons is uh, uh, platform, 
shifts it's yeah. called um second one was um platform leap yeah leapfrogging yeah. and putting digital at the core yes yeah, so the only um again when you when you write this stuff you sort of think mm -hmm. wait a minute this might be really good stuff actually mm -hmm. like maybe i'm quite clever for thinking yeah. of this um and this is one of those theories where i'm like someone else must have written about this surely mm -hmm. and i don't think they have i did a lot of research um so this idea of putting digital at the core so um this sounds quite pretentious, but mm -hmm. as people, you know, we have our sort of outer skin and mm -hmm. then we have sort of uh, knowledge that we have mm -hmm. and then we have skills and then our very core is a sense of who we are and, mm -hmm. and our values. And I think companies are the same. So the yeah. very centre of a company is its sort of mission statement and what it's on the planet yes. to do. On top of that, it then builds products and processes um, to, to sort of make things that it sells or experiences. On top of that, it then creates a marketing layer that distributes and it controls the yeah. price and you yeah. know, other sort of the, the P's of marketing. And on top of that, we have a communications layer. Yeah. And as a person, what we experience most readily as a consumer is the communications That's layer. Right. So we get to see the advertising, mm -hmm. we get to see the check-in desks yes. at the airport, we get to see the hotel rooms, yeah. we get to see the web site to book the car mm -hmm. um, and that's where we see most sort of digital innovation mm -hmm. happening and actually that's where it makes the smallest difference so you know for, for most companies they they sort of dabble with digital transformation in a way which is like garnish yes um, I mean this is kind of an inappropriate analogy but there used to be a TV show called pimp my ride yeah I know, have, you, have you ever seen I, it or not? I, I heard that <laughs> one, yeah you don't I forgot to... about it remind me <laughs> So Pin My Ride is this TV show yep. where they take a kind of completely ruined, you know, Ford Cortina from 1973 and they sort of strip out the seats and they, they, they put on like chrome rims um, and they put in an amazing in-car entertainment system. I don't think I put this in the book actually, I should have done. Um, <laughs> and they give it an amazing paint job. Yeah. Um, but the car is still a terrible car. Like, it's going to break down the next day. Like, the brakes are going to be terrible. Yeah. But they've made these very superficial changes to it to make it look like a good car. You know, and actually, you know, mo it's a great TV yes. show, but most people shouldn't be buying cars like that. Most people should be buying a sort of high and Dyson Arsenal yeah. or something. Yeah. And I think for me, digital transformation is often these very, very superficial, very snazzy gestures that are mainly you know to the financial markets to be like hey guys you know walmart may be um sorry amazon may be completely destroying our business but if you go to the store in times square we've got an ipad in the corner you know? <laughs> yes <laughs> and on the ipad yes. it, it recognizes yes. your face and it suggests yes. you know sneakers that you might want to buy yes. And I'm there thinking, you know, three people have ever touched this iPad and they're all people that work for the company because yes. they were bored one day at lunchtime. Yes. Um, or it's, um, you know, hurts the car rental company. You know, their app is absolutely terrible. You can't email the yeah. company. Uh, their whole business model is somewhat vulnerable to people like um, Uber. Um, but yet you go to some of their branches and they have these video conference screens so you can sort of phone up the person and ask them questions in like perfect 4K resolution. Yep. And again, I'm just thinking, I, I don't want a video call with someone because they've lost my booking. Yes. I just want them to not lose my booking, really. Yes. So, so that's a very interesting thought because I, you know, I, I think of the hotel industry. Yeah. It's very similar. You know, there's these uh, technologies that suddenly, oh, we have a, a keyless entry <laughs> or something. In one branch. Yeah. In one yeah. branch. And uh, this is now the news. Or, or, <laughs> uh, uh, or, or you can uh, you touch, with touch open versus uh, yeah. whatever the old way and and so the, the thing is this the way i see it is that fundamentally they don't change their business they just as you say they they still run what i call a pipeline business yeah. a very very linear absolutely uh, we, we 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 produce we, we put a hotel there then we then we create a services around it then we market it then we yeah. sell it and and so absolutely. forth and, and rather than rather than let's say airbnb which is a platform absolutely. business which says we don't, and as you said, we don't even have to own the hotel yeah. or the accommodation. We we put we put technology at the center, namely we in our technology enables an exchange between the consumer or the traveler and the spare room here in, of of the yeah. owner of a spare room, yeah. and we we create a matching mechanism, yeah. and there could be a hotel in. 
a hotel in, it could be a room in a 600 year old castle in Ireland, yeah. in the same way as it is an apartment here on New York Absolutely. City. Somewhere. And the amazing thing about that is at the moment, um, you know, that might be for um, spare bedrooms or yes. for hotel like facilities or for castles. Yeah. But actually, you can end up expanding so that you do that for, um, you know, mobility. You do that for caravans to rent. You do that for personal training facilities. You do that for, um, you know, private chefs that come to yeah. your apartment. Like your ability to take a platform yeah. that has trust and has reach yes. and then turn it into a platform for other things. Is so here's the thing. The, um, what I really like about the book is you, you have this thesis that, um, the, the typical thesis is this, uh, in the, out there. Uh, companies, the traditional companies, the Bitburgers, yeah. the, the traditional, the, the John Deere's, the Monsanto, the, the very normal uh, American companies, let's say. They have this, um, they, they are facing disruption. Um, they are, they, they don't see the biggest opportunities they have. They are too slow. Um, they just can't let go of their uh, existing ways of doing things. They don't, and while a startup is coming around that, that, uh, that may be unrecognized by this very incumbent uh, and say it's like, oh, this is a crappy startup. Look, they don't have any clue. They don't even have engineers, you know, in some ways. How can they really <coughs> challenge us? You know, yeah. we are the incumbents market leader. That's the theory that's been dominant. It's called uh, Clayton Christensen yeah. disruption theory. Yeah. So you say that's not really how you think about disruption. Yeah. What I like about mm -hmm. this is the positive view that, that actually companies see that it's just that, yeah, you have to explain your theory. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I like the way that you're getting to this because mm -hmm. um, something I'm very aware of in the modern world is it's very difficult to have a nuanced debate. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's easy to write a book saying no one is watching TV, TV is dead, mm -hmm. or to write a book saying TV is going to be around forever, mm -hmm. everyone's watching it. It's very difficult to write a book saying mm, TV is complicated. It's very difficult to say that global warming is complicated. Yeah. It's very difficult to say that... Um, all companies face existential, uh, sorry, not all companies face existential yeah. threats. Yeah. So I think, I mean, there are a couple of things going on here. One is um, there are lots of companies that haven't done this because it's mm -hmm. not in their interest to do that. Like Procter & Gamble were not stupid to not invent um, Dollar Shave Club because yes. Dollar Shave Club is vastly unprofitable, has taken out all of the ability to make margin Absolutely. in that category. Yeah. So you'd have had to be in a complete idiot at Procter & Gamble yeah. to say, hey, why don't we just create a really cheap form of razor blades? It would never happen to go yeah. upstairs and say, hey, I'm going to create a business that disrupts our business yeah. and it's not going to make any money. Yeah. I was going to say, like, LVMH did not wake up in the morning and go, why don't we make cheaper champagne? Like, why don't we completely remove our ability to charge yeah. a premium from champagne? Yeah. So they'd be idiots for saying that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's interesting, mm -hmm. um, there, there is complexity to it. Mm -hmm. But you can look at McDonald's and be like, mm, like they could have made Shake Shack. Mm -hmm. You know, it would have been quite useful for them to have created yeah. a more premium version of what yes. they did to leverage their expertise. Yeah. It would have been quite interesting for BMW to have created Tesla rather than for Tesla to create Tesla. Yes. It would have been quite interesting for Toyota to have made Uber instead of Uber making yes. Uber. Um, yeah. So I look at this and I think, you know, what's going on in these big companies? Mm -hmm. And I think I, I have a theory for disruption and it is a work in progress. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not arrogant enough mm -hmm. to say Christian Clayton is wrong and his theory is nonsense. But I am saying it explains everything until about the year 2005 brilliantly. Yes. And it explains nothing that's happened since 2005. I love that. Yeah, that's like, the, you know, Tesla was not a cheaper competitor to BMW. It was an incredibly yes. expensive car. So his theory doesn't hold to be true. Yes. The iPhone was an incredibly expensive smartphone. Um, so that doesn't hold to be true. So whether it's Airbnb not being a cheaper way to spend the night in hotels, whether it's Uber not being a cheaper way to get around town, every single success story, Facebook, Dyson, um, you know, even people like sort of Donald Trump, they were not success stories because the, they have like a fundamental economic difference in how they do things. They're success stories because they serve the population better. Yes. Um, so I've got this theory to do with the sort of design process mm -hmm. and what I call evolutionary funnels. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, which kind of is sort of based somewhat on some of the work done with sort of paradigms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the reality is that every, every sort of product, um, you know, your factory line that you were talking about before, it's a product of expertise that over time comes together to make a product better and better and better. Yes. So, you know, you look at the work of, um, I know, port portable cassette players. Like, so yes. the Sony Walkman yes. was an amazing Walkman. It got better and better and better and better and yes. better. And just when you get the very best Walkman the world has ever known, you then got the invention of the personal CD player, which while it was the worst ever CD player, it was still better than the best ever Yes. Um, Sony Walkman. Yeah. And what we saw there was a shift where all of a sudden, like completely different problems had yeah. to be solved. So rather than creating very powerful motors that turn yeah. slowly, you had to create a very um, fast spinning motor yeah. to spin the CD. You now have to have lasers that scan the surface of the CD and yeah. take information off that. You now have to create things like anti shock protection, yeah. not Dolby. So completely different problems to be solved. I, I have a, a good example. Like every car company. Yeah has over 100 years now since Mercedes-Benz, uh, Carl Benz invented yeah. a car first, um, the engine, um, uh, has created a, this, this pipeline or value chain yeah. with a set of activities. And if yeah. you look at how what BMW does and what Mercedes does and Audi, if you just look at this category, they all have identified Absolutely. the very same process. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's your theory. And they all have optimized their own process. So they get optimized and optimized and optimized, exactly. but only within one process. Paradigm. Within and one there's paradigm. no way like that improvement cycle of making a BMW 5 series would never ever ever have ended up with the Tesla because Tesla started from a completely different place where That's actually right. all of the problems they had were vastly vastly different so the kind of theory behind my theory on disruption is you have these evolutionary funnels which lead to the kind of optimal solution yes. and you get um, uh, sort of ever smaller returns as technology gets better and better and better yeah. Because in the case of a Walkman, in the case of a BMW 5 Series, you just can't make a combustion engine that's going to do 100 miles per gallon. Yes. And then this other company comes along, and it's not despite the fact they've never done that. It's because they've never done that. Because they haven't assumed the, the, the way to power a car is petrol or gasoline. Well, they I, see it from a different point. Because they don't presume that cassettes are the best ever thing. Because they don't presume that LCDs are the best technology for TVs. They suddenly approach the problem from a different way, normally from a customer-centric perspective. So normally they've looked either at customers and their behavior, like Airbnb yes. or like Facebook, or they've looked at a technology, in yeah. the case of Tesla, and they fundamentally shift the entire market to yeah. a completely different sort of paradigm. And that for me is disruption. And, and, and uh, in the car business, the, the number one uh, type of engineer employed is a mechanical engineer. <laughs> yeah. And if yeah. there are 1,500 mechanical parts in the, in the, in, in, in the combustion engine, yeah. that's good for the mechanical engineer. Absolutely. Because yeah. they have, that's what they've studied, yeah. that's what they have worked in. That's the life of a car company. And, you know, absolutely, and that whole culture exactly. will be a culture that quite rightly celebrates mechanical engineering. Like yeah. Probably the people that run the factory will be mechanical engineers. Certainly the global head of design will be kind of steeped in mechanical design theory. And his idea that you're suddenly going to employ someone that goes, wait a minute, we need to have an electrical combustion, and now we need to roll out charges across the whole country. And actually, now we don't need the same sort of repair ecosystem because these cars are very rarely going to break down. We are going to and now we need software engineers. Like, no person exactly. who knows a lot about mechanical engineering is ever going to turn the other way and sort of pray at a different altar. So. Yeah, which, which is a real... I, I love the theory because, because it, I think it, it describes... Not, not that Clayton Christensen is wrong yeah. in many ways, but it, it explains so many... Um, uh, situations where the competition comes from anywhere. A, co a California <laughs> computer company absolutely. creates a mobile phone. Yeah, absolutely. And now, here's the thing that upsets me so much. Nokia had the best <laughs> brand. Nokia had the form factor. You know, we all knew yeah, a Nokia yeah, phone. They had all the technology. They had the expertise. They had the operators. They owned the operators that are like the at and of the world. Yeah. They would sell Nokia. Yeah. They had the distribution channel. They had, they had all the strengths. And so much money as well. Yes. Yeah. So the interesting thing about that is, I mean, I worked um, making advertising and marketing for the yeah. Nokia N series, which yeah. were the most advanced phones in the world. Yes. And, and what... Then, you know, they didn't actually do a lot wrong. I think it's quite easy in retrospect to look at these companies and be like, these people were yep. idiots. Like, what were Kodak doing? Like, what were Blockbusters doing? When you actually look into these stories, and, and I was there, mm -hmm. like, it's never normally that simple. Like, the yep. one mistake that Nokia made is they made the very, very best hardware in the world. 
um, but the way that you used it was quite clunky. So you could do things that even five years later on the iPhone, the iPhone still couldn't do. But the way you would do that would be horrible. So if I was having a conversation with you right now and you were like, oh, I like that picture, can you send it to me? Like I'd probably have to press like 23 buttons, yeah. probably yeah. like accept permissions about five times, uh, probably type in your email mm -hmm. address awfully. Um, what the iPhone did is it just made the things that Nokia could do um, be much easier to yeah. do, much more sort of gestural. Like. Yeah. So the, the big learning lesson is that if you want to move, if you want to do the paradigm shift, you got to start from this consumer or outside perspective. Yeah. That, that rather than the constraints of your own sort of like the, your, your own organization, even the most, the best organizations, you know, the ultimate driving machine, the yeah. best car companies, that is a constraining factors, factor because you, you are serving more the, the paradigm, the dominant paradigm, Absolutely. rather than the, uh, the leap. Yeah. That, that you actually try to achieve. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, if you were to look at the sort of focal point mm -hmm. of a manufacturing company, mm -hmm. um, the issue is they're too good at doing what they do today, mm -hmm. and they're too sort of inward focused. And I'm not sort of blaming them. I'm just yeah. pointing this out. You know, everyone, uh, you know, there. Are, imagine how many engineers there are at BMW, or there were at BMW, that were great at combustion mm -hmm. design. Imagine how many amazing gearbox engineers there were. Imagine how many great sort of um, you know, transmission experts there were. Like, there are all these experts, and then around them are people sort of reinforcing the current state of affairs. So there'll be research that showed that miles per gallon is mm -hmm. important. There'll be lots and lots of data that shows that in the past, um, how quickly cars accelerated was one of the most important mm -hmm. things. And they sort of reinforce the kind of current mindset based yeah. on data which has mm -hmm. been created by the current mindset. And then they employ people like me at advertising agencies to basically tell them that everything they're doing is wonderful and how exciting it is that the new car is, you know, 2% more efficient. And, and they're, they're sort of designed to be good at what they are. They're sort of designed to, mm -hmm. to be like that. And therefore, there's a huge amount of vulnerability. Uh, and one more thing is they'll employ mm -hmm. management consultants that perfect the way they're doing things. So if, yes. they buy, you know, if you buy tires from this factory in Peru... Thank you. Throw uh, us under the bus. Too, <laughs> you, know? You, know, you already sort of like said something about agencies or like consultants. I'm throwing us all under the bus. <laughs> good. Um, but they're very good at sort of... Uh, at solving the factory production yeah. line of making, yeah. rather than saying, do we even need this factory production? Yeah. Like no management consultant I ever went to the New York Times, you know, in 2005 and said, do we even need to print papers anymore? Like, I don't think that's really yeah. the conversation. They, they do a good job of reinforcing the current situation. Yeah. What we really need is people like you and your skills uh, to represent the voice of consumers. Mm -hmm. and to say, do you know what? Mm -hmm. There is a growing interest in this uh, thing. There is a totally different way to solve this problem. There is now this new amazing thing that technology makes mm -hmm. possible which you can take advantage of. Mm -hmm. And one of my most irritating but uh, maybe sort of profound questions is what would your company look like if you set it up today? Yeah. And I think, you know, if you were to create a bank today, you would not think how do we buy some really expensive real estate on every yes. main street in America and yeah. then create a very expensive building yes. and then have a huge vault in the, in the basement and employ lots of staff. Yes. And because this is also expensive, let's try and cross sell yeah. people mortgages and yeah. um, life insurance. Instead, you'd probably look at WeChat and you'd think, right, mm -hmm. you know, this exists on everyone's phone in China and this is how people make payments. Or you'd look at Venmo mm -hmm. and, you'd, and you'd look at people and yes. you'd look at artificial intelligence and yeah. you'd look at um, sort of transactional technology, and you think, right, you know, people's relationship is in the, with their money. Um, how can we, you know, own that interface between people and the things they buy and the financial decisions they make? And it's almost like imagining, sort of based on examples like WeChat, you can do everything on Messenger or yeah. something. You're imagining, and you you had a sentence in your, in under leapfrogging in your book, I love this one, create the entity that becomes the future of that company itself. Yeah, so the only good example of this being done before that mm -hmm. I know of is Netflix. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I spoke to Reed recently and he said it wasn't ever really a risk for them to uh, get rid of their DVD mm -hmm. mail order business because when they sat in 2000 and I guess 2002, 2003, mm -hmm. Like they knew that by 2020 we weren't going to have DVDs anymore. Like they, mm -hmm. they knew that that wasn't really going to exist. Yeah. So the only question really became, like, if this company is going to die, like, 
what do we need to change it to? And like, when do we make that decision? And they knew that it was going to be streaming. And they knew that the technology was going to be right about sort of 2007, 2008. Uh, so they made a huge change to their business, which I think their share price fell by 70% or something. Mm -hmm. Everyone thought they were idiots. Mm -hmm. um, and then in retrospect, they were geniuses. And I think there are quite a lot of industries that you can look at now and it's like, you know, you know that e-commerce is only going to become bigger. Yeah. Like it's not, it's not going to be the only way that we buy yeah. things, but like there's no one on this planet that looks at a line that's done that yeah. for 15 years and then thinks it's going yes. to do that. Yes. So we know that e-commerce is going to be bigger. Like we know that electronic propulsion oh. is going to be the primary way that um, cars yeah. um, start to take over the world. We know that it's less likely that we'll own vehicles. Like we know that um, you know, prefabrication in home construction is gonna be bigger. So there should be more companies that are looking at that and going, you know, we're making tons of money, yep. we have a great market share, life is good, what can we start creating that may ultimately become the future of our business? Um, but how do we make sure that we own it rather than our competitors? And, and I love this, Tom, because the, the, the notion is so, so, so uh, such a sane and healthy thought because, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, Reed Hastings from, from uh, uh, Netflix, yeah. he says, look, I'm in this business. I know what is, what, what is ahead streaming. I just needed to decide yeah. because the, 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 the management folklore, the, the, the yeah. typical writing is that uh, a uh, CEO comes in, he has this incredible vision, like John <laughs> F. Kennedy, we put a man on the moon, yeah. has no clue of how to do it, yeah. you know, return him safely to Earth, has a vision, then in, in, uh, you know, is, is driving the organization into some organizational transformation yeah. and massive internal restructuring yeah. to realize that vision. Yeah. And, and, and I think what you say is it is not like that. It is much more that you, uh, a much more healthy version of how a, um, a, a business evolves. And yeah. you know, you, you mentioned in, a metaphor in that book about the Tour de France. Yeah. I think that maybe captures that. I think so. I mean, so the idea, there might not be many cyclist fans that, that watch this, but mm -hmm. you know, the idea behind the Tour de France is there's a front group called the Peloton. There's maybe like five or 25 mm -hmm. riders in it. And there's a cyclist that goes to the front and breaks the wind and that makes yeah. it easier for the people to behind. And because it's hard to cycle at the front, you tend to do that for a while and then drop back. Um, and I think that as a sort of dynamic is probably how most industries are going to be, where every leader gets its chance to sort of lead the market and then they sort of drift back and go towards the back of the pack, probably never to make it to the front again. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to understand that, you know, I, um, you know, no offense to Facebook, yeah. but I can't imagine Facebook being the sort of primary social network called Facebook in 10 years time. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be that sure that Amazon will be the leader in e-commerce like for the remainder of humanity. Mm -hmm. um, so every business has to be aware that there will be hundreds and hundreds of businesses that are trying to take them down. Mm -hmm. And often by playing by different rules. So often, you know, it's, it's less likely that Amazon will lose to Walmart. Yeah. Um, it's more likely they lose to a company that we've never heard of today. Yeah. Um, and more likely to lead to a company that just completely changes the entire yeah. dynamic of the industry. But is it also possible that um, if, I, if, I, if I'm the uh, person, if I'm in charge of Facebook, let's say, uh, I'm Zuckerberg, kind of a nice idea. You know? <laughs> uh, sometimes at least, uh, when you think about some aspects of it, I guess. But it's also possible that this is a form, a company, a traditional company, or an existing company, an incumbent, could actually uh, uh, engineer its own disruption or its own evolution. Yeah. Sort of where they have a business, their own business, one that leads at one point in time and then uh, uh, and lets, let, and builds another business that then becomes the yeah. Like going from streaming, from, from paper, like Netflix yeah, going yeah. from paper and, and uh, basically to streaming or something. Yeah, so this is the interesting thing for me because mm -hmm. when I started researching this book and mm -hmm. I looked at this idea of, I mean, I'm kind of, I don't know whether it's my term or someone else's term, but self-disruption. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how can you yeah. um, somewhat risk losing your current market share or current profitability mm -hmm. in order to build the entity that becomes the future mm -hmm. of your business? And I presume there are going to be hundreds and hundreds of examples of this, but there are very, very few examples of people really doing this. Yes. And in fact, um, you know, candidly, there are companies that I work with now that try and create these units that are going to be the future of their business. Yes. 
And often they have this sort of uh, worst of both worlds situation where, you know, you look at this team and actually it's not particularly agile and it's not necessarily stuffed with the very best people in the company and it's not full of people that are incredibly entrepreneurial and they have lots and lots of money but the money means that they have to fill in spreadsheets before they're allowed to do anything and they have to show the ROI before they do anything. And you end up in this weird situation where you've got the worst of both. Mm. And it seems like in theory you'd be able to have a best of both situation. Yes. Like if I was, you know, imagine I was going to wake up tomorrow and set up um, a smart plug company yeah. and I was going to call it um, Winky Winky. Mm-hmm. Like I would have no money and I'd have no expertise in smart plugs and I'd have access to no marketing agencies. I'd have no data. Yeah. I'd have no premises to work from. I'd have no factory production line. I would look at a company like Belkin or Philips and just think, oh my God, it must be amazing to be them. Um, you know, they've all this money, all this expertise, like yeah. software engineers on tap, like market data. But increasingly, it's these small companies that don't really know what they're doing yes. <laughs> who are able to sort of upset those companies. Yes. So it's very interesting to me to think, how can you actually combine the best of both? Yeah. Like, you know, and I presume that the answer was that there would be a way for these big companies to sort of incubate these smaller companies yes. Yes. Um, and a way for them to sort of take ownership of them. Yes. Um, and increase, or, or to set them up themselves. Increasingly, I think they probably just have to buy them. Like increasingly, I think, you know, it, there would there is yep. a significant role for BMW to have bought Tesla. You know, on you know nine years ago. Yes. There's a significant role for uh, Facebook to have bought Snap. Not on yes. not when it was worth eight billion dollars when um, you know even became quite ego driven. Yes. But instead, to have bought it you know, when the curve was like that. And you see some examples of that yeah. happening, but it's, it's still primarily seen um, as, as a sort of a last ditch effort when companies buy very big yes. companies rather than much more early things. I really like the, th- the thesis of the book because it, I think this is something I, I would highly recommend reading. I, I must say I bought it and I read it and I read it and I read it and, um, and it, it, uh, it's, uh, it's well written. It yeah. is... Uh, it is very thoughtful. It has your sense of humor <laughs> that we are know know from the from the social media. That's very kind of it. Yeah, it does, and it, it sort of gives you a new perspective. You know, yeah. it says, you know, nothing wrong with maybe the disruption theory. Here is how I see it. Yeah, and and the key part that I think it is this implication. It has a significant implication the way you think about a business. It is not that you don't and the thesis. It is not that you don't see, you know, that you are blind, that you are yeah. l- not so smart like some a startup. It is that you, you, for whatever reason, don't probably execute your own startup, your, what you say is become the future of, you, of yourself. Yeah. And you don't execute it properly uh, because of many f- factors that are, uh, that are part of being at a larger company. Yeah. And, and that prevents you. And, that prevents you of being successful yeah. uh, in the transformation to what a platform business to what a new new tr- to a new tr- a transformation. Yeah. Um, so it's not and and it and and a startup can do it easily because it's unencumbered with all the cons- the, yeah. the organizational realities. Yeah. Uh, and and therefore maybe the acquisition is may, is the better better route. I think so. the, the proper timing of the acquisition. I was going to say like when I very said, expensive. I'm aware when I said um, you just have to like create a vision and Netflix yeah. knew that it was going to be streaming and they knew it was going to happen in 2007. Like I'm not suggesting this is easy. Like mm-hmm. I think it's. Like, and it sounds quite contradictory. I think it's simple, but it's very difficult. Mm-hmm. I think it's, 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 it, it's organizationally not difficult, but to actually, um, uh, and, and you have to sort of think in a sort of reductive, focused way. But at the same time, knowing the right time is, is extremely hard. And Great. there are many, many success stories of companies that got the timing right, and there are many, many failures we don't hear about because they got the timing wrong. And there's a lot of survivorship bias yes. that happens there. Very cool. Uh, I have to ask you this question because yeah. I, I I always think when I see your tweet, your, your your follow you, then I always think like, oh, this is really ni- nicely captured of what just happens right now. What have you been thinking today or this week? What sort of like, <laughs> what are the three things that you would would sort of like let, leave the reader with and says, That's what bothers it. me these day today is X. What question. would that be? 
Um, I have so many thoughts. Um, I don't know, I think um, it's a bit small, but I think QR codes are, are more interesting than people realise. Coming um, again back, yes, good. I think so. I mean, yeah. like, you know, why is every single not printed surface around us not have some codes that allow us to sort of jump from that to a, another situation? Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot about this idea of, um, like, most things that are sort of digital today are kind of digital equivalents mm -hmm. of things that if we were to create today, we wouldn't have created in the first place, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. we have a lot of digital metaphors for analog things. So whether it's a ticket that's now a digital ticket, mm -hmm. I think increasingly a lot of things won't be digital versions of old things. They'll be brand new things. So we won't... Um, a good example is train tickets. Like We won't yep. have a digital pass on our phone. We'll just get on a train and will be charged automatically at the end of the month based on what train journeys oh. we took. And it might be that they've used facial recognition, it might be they've tapped into the GPS in our phone, but we won't have a ticket, we'll just have a sort of permission in the cloud, if that makes sense. You have a name for this. We are in the middle age. Yeah, the mid-digital age. Mid-digital age. Yeah, so, you know, I think, um, I spent half of my life thinking, I can't believe we haven't got to grips with this yet. Yeah. We've had phones for smartphones for 10 or 12 years. Yeah. Why is this still not happening? And I spent a lot of time also thinking, do you know what? This is new. We haven't really made sense of this yet. Yeah. You know, and I think there will be a period of time when we look back on these times and we're all quite perplexed by it. Uh -huh. You know, so this, there will be a time called the post digital age where we've understood the meaning and the power and the business model transformation behind this. At the moment, we're kind of dabbling with it. And it's going to be amazing to look back and just be like, do you remember when we had to type in passwords? Like, yep. you know, do you remember when you had to like check 19 <laughs> different inboxes to yep. see who they emailed you because you couldn't aggregate them all into one place? Like, do you remember when you had to like pick up a remote control and you had five different remote controls and you couldn't yep. just say to your TV, I want to watch Friends right yep. now? Like, it, like, it'll be fascinating to look back on it, I think. I, I am so fascinating. This is a very <laughs> positive note to start because life will be much simpler without so. having to have a ticket. Absolutely. And, and the big thesis, thesis, thesis here is that uh, we have only digitized our analog lives, but Absolutely. we need to go to the next stage of Absolutely. things. Absolutely. It's a very good thought. There was a tweet from, um, I can't remember his second name, but um, a guy yeah. called Aaron from Box, Aaron mm -hmm. Levy, and he sort of said, um, you know, the first stage of the internet is sort of transforming what we've known before. The second stage is building what we would have built if we, all we'd known is, is the sort of technology today. And I think that will be amazing. You know, what does the internet look like when we've completely rethought it? I really have to stop and I wish I could <laughs> continue another conversation. I am here with Tom Goodwin, the author of the book Digital Darwinism. He is followed by more than 500,000 <laughs> followers. Just sort of for the record, I have 5,000, so that's how little I am relative to Tom. Tom, Survival of the Fittest is a book I highly recommend. Kogan, Kogan Page, I think it's a British publisher. Yes. Wonderful book. Thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. I much appreciated. I hope we have another chance to get together no, when great. you're back in the city. Yeah. Um, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>